Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, raise your hand if you know why. Today is called National Welcome Back to Church Sunday. You know, Jamie? Uh, you think you know. Does anybody know why that it is called that? Okay. Huh? Summer's over? Summer's over. <laughs> you know why we'll come back to church, right? <laughs> because summer's over, right? We had our hiatus from our righteousness. Now let's get back to church. Is that it? No, I, 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 if you think about it, uh, what was last Sunday? What date was last Sunday? 9-11. And what is 9-11? It's a commemoration of the World Trade Center bombing. And when was the largest coming back to church for generations in the United States of America? The Sunday after. So the Sunday after 9-11 is the official welcome back to church Sunday. So welcome back to church, you guys. Now, I see all my, uh, my faithful attenders here this, Sunday, this morning. We talked earlier about, uh, Brother Ben reminded us about the uh, orientation kind of Bible study, adult uh, Bible study time that we're having uh, with Brother uh, Andrew Thompson, who is uh, doing our thing on evangelism. I think it's very important and it is extremely important given our uh, current context here in the United States of America and certainly even within our own parochial situation here in this community. Uh, how we can reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, how important it is for us to be able to speak to people winsomely about the gospel of Christ, about the work of Jesus Christ, about what God is doing in the world, and that sort of thing. And all just bring the witness of Christ uh, into the various places where we find ourselves, whether it be in our subdivisions or in our schools or in, in the particular uh, community outreach uh, uh, things that we're doing uh, in, in the broader county here, whatever it might be that we're doing, being able to bring this message about Jesus, this important message. And what I want to do today, and you have your outline there with you, I want to point out to you uh, a little uh, bit about what has been most recently found uh, concerning the church in the United States of America. So the Christian church uh, has really been a cornerstone of American life here in the United States of America for centuries, actually. But that has really changed in these past 30 years. There's been a huge shift in the importance of the Christian church in the greater uh, community. Christians are, of course, attending church less, but it appears that more people are experiencing and in practicing their faith more. So there does seem to be a little bit of an increase in the practice of the faith uh, uh, outside the four walls of the church. But as for church attendance itself, obviously, the statistics don't lie, that is down. Millennials in particular, uh, those born, I think, since, uh, what is it, 1990, um, uh, the millennials in particular are coming of age uh, really at a time of great skepticism and a lot of bit of cynicism, especially about foundational institutions. And the Christian church in America, it was a foundational institution and is a foundational institution. And so there's some suspicion among that group as they come of age about that kind of thing, those, those uh, hallmark or cornerstone institutions of our country. And uh, the church is, is not uh, exempt from that kind of criticism and evaluation. And we can all appreciate the, uh, that given the scandals of mainline denominations, etc., that there might be some uh, reason for that among uh, uh, people just learning about uh, the church or how the church is. And there's also been a, a broader kind of secularization of the American society. In fact, it's almost been ensconced now into our culture that we should be completely secular. Uh, that this is not a, a uh, we need to have a strict, a really strict separation between anything that has to do with our Christian founding or our, our Christian uh, churches, uh, the foundation of Christian churches in, in society, their effectiveness, that needs to be completely separated out uh, from our society. Uh, you, can call, you can call into question perhaps somebody's uh, moral direction in which they're going. Uh, you, can, uh, uh, you, you can disregard that and you can disregard the church. Nothing is important. It's just whatever anybody says in a given, given day. That's the only thing important. Well, George Barna Group conducted an analysis then of kind of what is the state of the church 
that is the Christian church as we've known it as having been an influential institution, but also <coughs> as it is at its, as it was lived out in the days that we all grew up, as we grew up, uh, in which it was the cornerstone of a community. I mean, literally, uh, when you went into a community, the, the highest point of any place in any small town was the steeple of the church. That was the highest thing in the church, in, in the community. Uh, it was visible from, from everyone who lived in the community could see it, uh, and, and that sort of thing. So, what has this shift done? What is, what is it doing? So he looked at that. And so, uh, Barna Group, you know, is a Christian survey group, and so uh, we're going to look at some of those things. We're going to look at eight things that were found out about that in your outline. Uh, uh, gives you some graphs there. I think the graphs help people, help you see quickly uh, what has been found out. Well, most, number one, most Americans, most Americans still identify as Christian. So if you did a general survey of the population, most Americans who are Americans, who were born and raised and grew up here, uh, even those who perhaps have, have nat uh, naturalized uh, into citizenship, many of them will identify themselves uh, as Christians. And even though the United States of America has kind of, we've kind of set aside, certainly within the last uh, decade, we've set aside the idea that we're a Christian country, uh, nonetheless, you still have people uh, who uh, see the uh, Constitution as something that has treated Christianity in a special way. And we still uh, have a great, within our, even within our, uh, our, our polity as a nation, we still have great respect for the Christian community and Christian churches. Uh, most people uh, in this country do identify that as being Christian anyway, and almost uh, three quarters of those Americans uh, say that they are, uh, that say they're Christian, and then 20% claim uh, no faith at all. So we've got uh, a lot of people in the, in the country that say they're Christian, and then some who say, eh, they're not at all. And about 6% that are Islamic and Buddhist and, and Muslim and, and perhaps uh, uh, Hindu and Jewish, Jewish, but mostly Christian. Secondly, attending church is a good indicator of faith practice. What was found is that those who are exercising their faith the most are the people who are attending churches. So as I was pointing out to the children, as I asked them, what is it about church attendance that's important? And they pointed out the things that were important. I, I, could, I don't think anybody here would disagree with what they said. They thought was important about uh, being in a, uh, a church setting. One is to grow in faith. One is to exercise your gifts that God has given you. That is to uh, helping and, and being a, a helping part of the, of the faith community. And then encountering Christ within the faith community. So those things are important. And I still think that uh, we, we, can, we can say the people who are actually practicing their faith, are, those that do so are also those that are more likely to be in attendance. When a self-identified Christian attends a religious service at least once a month, that they identify them then as at least being a practicing Christian. Uh, so that was the criteria they used. Once a month, if they were in worship service, and that was a regular thing for them, uh, that at least once a month, and sometimes it would have been more, but they do at least that, they considered that then as, as a practicing Christian. And as they asked them other questions in the survey, which we'll consider, then these people would identify as obviously people who are practicing their faith more. They're doing more to practice their faith. So researchers then uh, argue, uh, I mean, uh, the, this, that this represents, if you will, a more uh, accurate picture. When you're talking about how really active Christians are, the more accurate picture is those that are frequent or considered to be regular attenders. Uh, but Barna has discovered that almost half of all American adults uh, would be designated as post-Christian. Now you have on the back page, if you look on the back page of your outline, you'll see some of the characteristics of the post-Christian. Now it's, it, it's difficult to it's difficult, at least for us who, who have grown up largely in Christian communities. When I say largely in Christian communities, those of us who have been regular in attendance in worship, regular in attendance with church, have been associated with congregations and churches, we really are in a Christian environment. That would, that would constitute part of a Christian environment. We would see that as very important in our life. We tend then to have our friends in that congregation, or within that circle of that Christian environment, right? 
But yet, there are those who may be simply called post-Christian. They, they move beyond that into either a total secularization, totally, or to somewhat embracing secularism. Now, in that group of those uh, who are post-Christian, identify themselves that, uh, they would have 60% of these, of these qualities that you see here under post-Christian, under, under the terms there on that last page, post-Christian. They would have these characteristics. 80% would have these characteristics if they were highly post-Christian. And, and you can see there's a list of them there, uh, uh, not believing in God, being an agnostic or, or uh, being atheistic. Um, they disagree that faith is important in life. They have no prayer life. Uh, they have, they've never really made any kind of commitment to Jesus Christ whatsoever. Uh, they disagree that the Bible is accurate, that the Bible has a lot, they, they'll say that it has lots of errors. Um, they don't donate to the church. They don't attend church. Uh, they agree that Jesus committed sins. Uh, they don't feel a responsibility to share the faith with anybody. Uh, they have uh, not read the Bible. Uh, the reason I go through this list is you have to know that 60% of the people that you may be witnessing to out there, up to 80% of those that you may actually encounter, have these characteristics. This is what they hold. And so as you're witnessing in Christ to them, uh, it's important to know that this may be some of the people that you will encounter. Uh, they've never volunteered for a church. They have not attended Sunday school in the last uh, uh, week or so. Uh, they've not attended religious small group uh, in, uh, any at all in, in the last week. They, they, all of these kind of things, they're just not involved. They're just not involved in what one might call uh, the, the Christian church or the Christian experience. Although they may even identify themselves as Christian because it, it's a tradition. Uh, you know, it's a tradition. Their parents are Christian, so they just call themselves that. Number three, most Americans who attend uh, Sunday services attend small or medium churches. I thought that this was important because all of the, it seems that in, in, as far as the popular media is concerned, who gets all the press? The ones that get all the press are the very large, large ministry. Uh, whether it's Joel Olstein's ministry, 40,000 people attending uh, on a week there, or that sort of thing. So you have these huge, the uh, First Baptist Church of Dallas, uh, you have these huge ministries of just thousands and thousands of people uh, uh, over tens of uh, thousands in some cases, and they get a lot of attention. That's not where most of the Christians are in this country. Uh, most Christians are not in those uh, churches. In fact, a very small amount are what you might call churches of greater than a thousand uh, in membership. There's only about 8% of the Christian involved community. 46% uh, are in churches of less than 100 people. And uh, 37% are in churches between um, 100 and, and, and 499 or 500. So you can see that there is a, uh, the majority by, by far uh, is uh, in churches um, that are under 500 people, but mostly in churches uh, of under 100. Now why is that? One might think, well, why is it? Well, you can drive around uh, uh, how many communities in the state of, of Georgia do you know how many how many towns and I know some of you travel a lot uh, through the different counties and towns your job how many towns and villages in this state have a church street 90 <laughs> percent I mean all the small you know, I drive you a bit of a distance to come here, and I guarantee you, I drive to a lot of communities, and they all have a church street. They all have a church street. And I guarantee you, on that street, there are probably several churches. And so, as you can see, when you begin to multiply the number of churches you have in a community, uh, you can drive from here to I-20 on any of the roads, main roads that go from here to I-20, and you'll pass several churches, right? And so, obviously, most of America is in small churches. And why is that? Because you get to know people. You get to have friendships there. You get to interact with people. You get to care about people more in those. And the really, really successful mega church, when I say successful, I'm talking about they really do evangelism. They're really sending missionaries around the world. They're really doing their thing. Every one of them that are truly successful in the Christian mission of being a witness to the ends of the, uh, of the world, to really following the Great Commission, all of them, have very, very active small groups. Because it's in the small groups that ministry takes place. And so uh, you can tell that uh, 
we get the idea that, that the mega church is where it's happening, but really where ministry is happening, really where the Word of God is getting out, in many, many cases, is in the smaller congregations around the, around the United States. Number four, there are more church than unchurched in America. Now, that's kind of hard to believe. That, that doesn't necessarily mean weekly Sunday attendance, but it does mean that they are church. And we consider church in, in various ways. You consider church and unchurched, but we, we say that the church adults are those that are active churchgoers who are attending church services uh, um, with uh, some variation of frequency within the last six months. So people who at least within the last six months are, have attended a service or would attend a service in a local church, and that's other than a wedding or a funeral or something, really attending a worship service on a Sunday morning or on a Sunday evening or whatever. Uh, then we can see that about 55% of our, of our citizenry is doing that. America is going to church those who are claiming to be Christian are uh, still going to church, not every Sunday attenders. Every Sunday attenders is still in the low percentile. Uh, but people that do are, are, are still in our communities. And by the way, your encouragement, your witness, your invitation to people is very important to them. Very important to them. There are people who go through different crises in their life, and you may be, in fact, God's voice or the voice of Christ in mercy, peace, and love towards that person at just the right moment uh, to reconnect them with Christ. Number five, Christians are more generous uh, than uh, the, their secular peers. Uh, and uh, this has been proved. Jesus has said that really one of the, if you will, a, a hallmark of living out the Christian life in the Sermon on the Mount, what he said is prayer, fasting, and the giving of alms. I mean, it's basically living a life that is truly Christian out in the community. And part of that is giving. The Christian church uh, is the largest giving organization as a single organization. And also, it's interesting that Christians are very much more likely to give their largesse to the churches that have a mission beyond themselves. So uh, uh, as people give to their churches, they're more likely to be giving uh, to congregations that are really active in their community, active in mission abroad, or whatever it might be. So you can see that little statistic, also the graph there that, that, that mentions that. Um, it's one of the pillars of healthy uh, spiritual life is the, is the uh, giving uh, to the work of the gospel, the work of the mission of the church. Also, it's reflective of a highly uh, uh, motivated uh, and, and regularly... Uh, demonstrated Christian life. Number six, Americans express their faith in a variety of ways. Um, for example, three quarters of Americans claim to have prayed to God in at least the last week. Uh, now this, this accords very much with the 73% that identify themselves as Christian, that is three quarters. Uh, but following prayer, the next most common activity that is related, according to Barna, that is related to faith practice is the attending of church services. So one of, one of the things that we see here is it's not only just an active prayer life. Somebody may, may say, no, I pray every day, although they might, that person is much more likely to be attending a, a, a worship service every day, be attending in a local congregation or be in church. Um, so that, that's important too to their lives. And about a third claim to be reading their Bible on their own. So we still have a way. So people can exercise their faith by prayer. They can exercise their faith by, by Bible reading. Now my, my, grand, my grandmother uh, was very particular about the churches she attended. Uh, and, but she never failed to pray and read her Bible every day. So, and that impressed me. That impressed me that she had her time in the morning for prayer and Bible. My mother was the same way. And although my mother was a every Sunday attender. Uh, but so people do express, and that's not anything really new. But today it seems to be more highlighted uh, because people are less likely to be involved uh, in a local church. And you see the graph there as well. Number seven, uh, evangelicals uh, are uh, a small group, but they're an influential group. In fact, evangelicals, as defined by this particular survey, is only about 7%. Of the Christian of the Christian um, people, so those that identify as Christian, 
about 7% are true, what would be, according to their definition, a true evangelical. If you look at your terms uh, back there, they give you the definition of evangelicals. And in the definition of evangelicals there, uh, on the back of your sheet there, you'll see some interesting things. These uh, uh, evangelical Christians have these seven characteristics, and these seven characteristics are important in their life. One is their faith is very important in every day. So every day of their life, faith is important. Uh, how they believe in Christ, what they believe about God is important how they carry out their everyday life. Secondly, they, they believe they have a personal responsibility to share their beliefs in Christ and about Christ with non-Christians. They think it is important to do that. What they have experienced in Christ, what they know about God in Christ, they want other people to have that kind of freedom in the gospel that they enjoy. And so they do, they do have a desire to do that. Uh, they believe that Satan really exists. He is our foe, as we sang in our hymn. Uh, uh, he is a foe that is seeking after us, but by God's grace and mercy and peace, we have Christ as our champion. And then they believe that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life upon earth, that he was the divine son of God, he lived a sinless life on earth, and he died for our sins. Uh, they uh, uh, assert that the Bible is accurate in what it teaches. So the Bible can be trusted as a trustworthy book. It does hold the truth of God. It's, it's God's word to mankind. They believe that eternal salvation is possible only through grace, not through where you can't work your way into heaven. It is by the grace of God that we are saved. As it says in Ephesians chapter 2, by, gra by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God and not from works, lest any man should boast. And so they believe that. They believe it is God's great gift and love. And then uh, they uh, describe God as, of course, having the attributes that we always have attributed to God, being all-knowing, all-powerful, the perfect deity, creator of the universe, who still rules and, uh, and uh, keeps the universe in, uh, uh, in motion and control even to this day by his very power. And so uh, those, that, that would identify the evangelical group. That evangelical group that is truly holds to what we would call the historic Christian doctrines, that group is, is a smaller group. It, it's even smaller than those who are attending every Sunday. Because you have a, you, there's, there's kind of uh, an eclectic view of the exercise of the Christian faith generally out there. And that's what it says in, uh, in our uh, discussion on number eight. Americans do hold, uh, or embrace as a whole, embrace uh, both an orthodox and heterodox view. And what does that mean? Orthodox view means from the scriptures, historical, the historical doctrines of the Christian faith that were worked out through the, through, through the uh, first uh, four centuries of the church uh, from the time of the death of Christ and, uh, uh, until about the, uh, uh, the beginning of the uh, fifth century, that through all that period, the, the solid biblical doctrines of Christ and, and the Trinity and God and the, and the Word and the Bible all were pretty much set down and have been followed generally in the church. That whole thing then was reformed again brought back to those roots of evangelicalism uh, then at the time of the Reformation in the 16th century. So in the 16th century we had a redo, or if you will, we, we, we restarted that, those original doctrines and things and began to move out from there again. Really the beginning of the new evangelicalism, if you will. And so that clearly has happened. But now there, there does seem to be... Um, with kind of the, the what is known as the uh, information superhighway. And people have uh, access to many different kinds of ideas and not necessarily attending every Sunday in, a, in what would be considered an Orthodox Christian community. Uh, and I mean that in the broad sense, not in the just the Eastern Orthodox Church, but in the broad sense of following the biblical doctrines. And so we see that, that Christians do have different ideas. And in those different ideas, a lot of, a lot of works righteousness comes into that. Um, a lot of people who believe in, uh, who will uh, uh, embrace things about God, but then they just, you know, the hell, hell and the devil don't exist. Uh, so, and, and yet they all would embrace, or at least embrace the title or the name Christian as their survey. So that's, that's where that's going from. If you look at your, uh, your chart there, uh, it's the best way to kind of, kind of do this. So um, 
when asked the question, as Christians have a responsibility to evangelize others, um, you'll see that about 26% strongly agree with that. Uh, and 19% disagree somewhat with that. 35%, however, agree somewhat that evangelism is a key part of the Christian faith. And what we're trying to teach through these, this, this series that we're doing now in Sunday School, we're trying to understand is it's one of the key things. The last thing Jesus told his disciples before he ascended into heaven in Matthew's gospel was in fact to evangelize the world. And so if that was the last thing Jesus had to say basically, and if you read it in Luke, it's in the first part of Acts, uh, uh, in the first part of the book of Acts, in that first chapter, you'll see, again, Jesus emphasizes that, that there are to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. And so evangelism is clearly, from Scripture, an important part of the Christian church, of the Christian faith, of the Christian enterprise, and of the kingdom of God. And so we need to be about that and equipped to do that. Uh, yet, in spite of the popularity of, of the belief that, that good works is sufficient for eternal life, uh, uh, as a long list of options about, you know, uh, describing God, still 57% choose the most orthodox view. And that is that uh, God is all-powerful, all-knowing, perfect creator of the universe, and he does rule the world today. And most people believe that. Even if in their practice they may be more heterodox, yet they believe that God is God, and he's in charge. Some way or another, he's in charge. Some way or another, he works his will out in our world. And only 33% uh, have other views about God. And then there is no such thing as God. You have 10% of the population basically who just don't believe in God. Uh, it's it's uh, higher in some uh, areas than it is in others. But that is generally kind of where we are right now in, in, our, in our society. This is the newest survey that has been done on that. And you can see there that there are many, many people that you are going to encounter out there in the, in the world that have these ideas that hold to these kind of things who may call themselves Christian. So if you start a conversation, uh, you know, are you a Christian? That person may say yes. That person may say yes. Uh, but uh, engaging them in conversation, you may find out something different. Well, what church do you attend? Well, I don't really attend church, you know, or whatever it might be. So we engage people in conversation, which is something you'll learn, in order to bring them to uh, uh, an understanding that there is a calling on their life by God uh, to be in Christ, both in their daily living uh, and in their life spiritually as they carry out the Great Commission in the world as well. And that's just something that we want to encourage you in uh, because God has uh, given us uh, many different gifts within His church to carry out precisely the expansion of the kingdom. And you already are involved in that in your, in your community here through different organizations that this church uh, is involved in, be it the preschool, be it uh, in the broader community where I know some of you are very active, uh, some of you being school teachers and you're in the school system, uh, others of you being in the um, uh, community with regard to uh, working with veterans, uh, many different ways in which you're involved in the community, whether it be in law enforcement or retired from law enforcement uh, and that sort of thing. So obviously God gives you many, many different opportunities to share this wonderful, wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. So I simply encourage you uh, to learn and to uh, avail yourself of the opportunity to practice uh, these opportunities to uh, witness to your neighbor. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let that peace of God, therefore, that passes our human understanding. Keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, even to life everlasting. Amen.